Okay, we're ready. Okay, so. You can you correct the minutes? Yeah. Well, I have a question, Dave. And on the minutes, Martha wrote under old business there, it says current tax rate for the general fund is lowered to 1.59%. Yep. Does that make sense? It does, only because. We well, have to explain Prior it. to last meeting, it was at 9.66. So it there was we changed. Okay. Oh, we it have. was uh, so we we changed we, we got some new insurance numbers and stuff and it lowered some things and we pulled money over to the highway fund. But this is the amount of increase. And mm -hmm. so it went from 9.66 to 9.59. So I think that. What she's trying to say is it was lowered from 9.66 to 9.59. That's, probably that's better, what I was trying to say. You're probably better say that because I don't okay. think anybody. Actually, I, I think it's not just the general fund. I think that was a total. Uh, okay, so what should it say? The, the overall. The overall tax rate. <clears throat> Due to the changes, the overall tax rate. It was lowered from 9.66% to 9.59%. I'm um, in the same vein. I, I'm reading under manager's notes the item two. And um, it, it's back, we were trying to clarify the pay for the select people. And I'm, and I'm reading that now and I'm, does it say that we get paid if we're here or regardless of if we're here? It's based on 26 <clears throat> meetings per year. So you, so whether or not you're here, your pay is based upon 26 meetings. Okay. Times. Should it say that? 30. So we're paying we're the times. flat amount, 26. Because mm -hmm. I found myself just, we are trying to make it clear and, and I came back sort of That's saying. It's not totally clear. It's not totally clear. say <laughs> something like uh, assuming good attendance or something at the bottom. But it's not assuming attendance. It is, it is 30 times 26. <laughs> I can't remember what that number is. Right. So it's oh, assuming it's 26 meetings. It's not assuming attendance at those 26 meetings. It is 30 times 26 gives you X amount is the pay for three of you. Right. 26 times 36 is pay for the chair and for the secretary. Yeah, so his, for historical purposes, it would be good to make that crystal clear. Okay. However you want to do it. Okay, I'm not sure how to make that crystal clear, but I'll work on it. You can do it. Otherwise, are the minutes good? They're yeah. wonderful. Yes. <laughs> That's not so wonderful. They are wonderful. <laughs> Two errors. Okay. Or clarification. And the minutes approved then. Um, there's some adjustment to the agenda that you want to. Uh, not that I know of. Okay. Hey, Tom. Any um, learning comments from the public at this point? Something? Oh, no, I was just thinking about the, uh, the people that have been avoiding the craters. One, two, five. Mm -hmm. One down here. I guess there's one up here, which I didn't see. I've hit it. Oh, that's not the good one. This one or that one? That Where is it? I, I, I think it's. it's more outside the village than I think it's around um, the which, which little one? settlement up on the hill. Um, Chet Pacho's little development up there. Oh, uh, yeah, that was that far. That's, That's what, what I think. Before. Yeah, that was the bad lands. Yeah, this went, what? I called it the bad lands. Yeah. That That's one I've hit. Yeah. Unless there's a, another well, one that one. they were talking about. Yeah, it was on the list, sir, I guess. Yeah, I saw it. By, uh, 
the service center is Mike Depot's. Yes, that's what it's Depot's right here. Though. Right, right. So it could be another one. It's closed. <laughs> yeah. But the one on the bridge is Mark. Yeah. It's got a cone. Yeah. The cone is sticking on the back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hit that one too. Is where the cone. Yeah, no. yes, John. So I have three concerns I'd like to bring forward uh, this evening. The first is I'm curious about what we're doing to track construction and get it in a timely basis added to the grand list. And the second is about our class three roads. I'm referring specifically to a question that was on the list served today about Rice Road. Rice Road is a road that originally probably had like half a dozen residences, and now they have 10 times that number. And it's typical of a variety of road, class three roads in our town, which have seen extensive development, but the roads themselves have pretty much re remained the same, except for a lot of gravel. And I'm wondering, going forward, how we're going to deal with the issue of allowing for pretty much uncontrolled development on these class three roads are, is our answer to do something about development or just keep bringing in more gravel? Because it seems to me that we're reaching almost a tipping point in the town in, in a number of areas, Rice Road being an example and Shoot Road being another one, where the impact of all this development on the nature of our back roads. You know, if we were in Hartford, these roads would probably be paved by this point. So that's my second concern. And then the third one is the information about Mace Hill, the Mace Hill culvert. Uh, I'm curious why at this point in the winter, when everything is frozen up, why we would have to close that road at this point, rather than perhaps just limiting it to passenger car travel and maybe eliminating trucks from there because closing it entirely makes a considerable inconvenience for those of us in the part of town where we would go to the hospital or to the church uh, or obviously for the people who live along that piece of road. So those are my three concerns. Would you repeat your first one again? Oh, my first one is about what are we doing to track construction um, and to see that it's added to the grand list in a timely manner. Okay. New, in other words, new buildings. Well, it's not just new buildings. I mean, it's also reconstruction. Anything that yeah. in some way adds to the grand list. Well, those, all of those issues are things that are talked about and dealt with to some extent. We can't fix everything. We can't fix the fact that people are building new homes in town and, and putting more stress on the, on the roads. You know, can we pave every road? That's not the answer either. So you know, I don't know that we have answers to all those questions. Um, if the first one, is something that we are going to deal with um, probably in another year, is that right, Dave? Something like that. Um, to, what's the other one? Thank you, Gordon. This is, this is the first one, the, the building? Yeah. Is track keeping track of construction yeah. and adding it into the grand list in a timely manner. But in the interim, we're going to be looking at and notifications or ordinances. Yeah, I was, a, year I, was a, I was approached uh, yesterday, in fact, by mm -hmm. someone who, who was one of those people who uh, escaped paying taxes for a couple of years, uh, thinking that why are we talking about adding uh, a code enforcement person when we already know a lot of this information just is there just to look at people who apply for septic you know, permits or people who apply for driveway permits but there's still other others that slip by so uh, what's the other thing you brought up into 
Well, the second one was the impact of this development, on, yeah. especially on our class three roads, yeah. which are basically our gravel yeah. we, roads. I mean, it appears to me that with increasing taxation of property and with the tremendous housing demand in the in this region, that further subdivision of property, especially along these back roads, is well, it's something that's happening, and it's probably going to continue to happen. And I think. To me, it seems like we're going to reach a point where just trying to repair the roads and all the infrastructure and keep up with all the demands of this additional development are really going to place an undue burden if we don't have a visioning process of some kind, rather than just reacting by repairing, having a visioning process to... Well, we, we have, have, it isn't completely disbanded, a road committee looking into these issues. And that's part of the reason why we have the committee. Also, the committee is trying to deal with um, regulations and uh, concerns that come down from the state, particularly drainage issues. And where does this water go and what's it taken with it? And what can we do about it? So it's not like a lot of forgotten concern. No, I'm just trying to keep it warm. <laughs> I also think you mentioned Hartford. Hartford's got probably extensive zoning. And as you know, that is not flown here ever. Um, so I don't know if there's too much an appetite for it now, but I kind of have it. On the other thing, I think about, um, you know, you're absolutely right about the class three roads and, and the increased pressure on them. But I think to pave a road costs about, is it a million dollars a mile? It's some exorbitant amount. So I don't know that that is a viable solution for our town. Um, Hartford, maybe they would do it, but they also have probably, I don't know, three times the population, and they've got businesses to support that uh, tax base more than we do. You know, we're mostly residential. So uh, it, you're right, these are endemic problems, and I don't know that they're going to go any away, but we do want, I think, we want families to move into town, or not just families. We want people to come here and want to welcome them. Um, and we can't also tell people, well, you can't sell that. You can't do that with your land, you know? So we'll continue to get subdiv subdivided parcels. What can you do? I don't know. Um, also, I think it has been a little unfortunate that we've had uh, development um, maybe too far out of the center of town. Mm -hmm. Right. And some of the back roads would have been left, would have been left, left more to nature and more, maybe more development closer in. It's a hard, it's a hard one to regulate. Um, about the Mesa Clover, I asked the same question, but the, the, I think the problem is, is that that is deteriorating kind of seriously on the one, on the uphill end of that upstream end. And I guess the concern is that it's going to deteriorate too much. And best, to, best to close it. And hopefully we'll get it um, repaired. It's going to be a new, it's new construction, which we, um, we have selected an engineering firm already so far to make the design what we're about to select. And uh, whether it gets fixed this summer or not is the question. Hopefully it will. You know, if we move that fast enough. Thank you. Okay. It'll definitely be an inconvenience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fortunately, it's not, it's not very far around. But, but Tom? Yeah. Um, one comment on one of Chuck's things here. The growth of new development in town on the roads also generates new revenue yeah. from the taxation of those properties, which in theory is going to help support maintaining the road for the traffic. Well, I understand, but I think there's a lot of data now 
showing that increased development does not necessarily lower the cost of operating the town on a proportionate basis. It actually, the data shows that it actually raises the cost of an operating a town on a proportionate basis. So, I, you know, I think there's conflicting data in that regard. I'm just back to your uh, position. My other reason, I guess, for being here tonight is Mason Road. <coughs> I've been living there for 30 years now, uh, driving in and out of there multiple times a day. And I was going to come in before I got that note on this surface week regarding the, the one-way bridge. It really needs, if it stays the way it is, it needs a yield sign on the Mace Hill side. Because when you approach it from either end of Route 12 coming around the corner, and if there's anybody coming down the hill, all of a sudden you find yourself both on the bridge. Mm -hmm. crossing there. Mm -hmm. If you're coming from three corners to four corners, you go around the turn. It just, it's difficult. And anybody coming down the hill that's unaware of what might be happening, a yield sign would at least cause them to be alert. And if anybody's in, headed in, you got to yield to them because they don't have much time to react. Mm -hmm. But the, the other thing is, I used to always come down Ballard Road and come out on Route 12. <laughs> It's a little less traffic, sort of thing. But the risk factor of coming out onto Route 12 from Bowers Road is about double what it is coming into Four Corners and your visibility each way. Traffic is rolling from Three Corners out Route 12. You pull out there, and it's just boom. There's somebody coming 50 miles an hour at you. And coming down the hill, sometimes the traffic is going more than that. I know the speed limit's less, but my thought was, if we're going to put all the traffic on the Bowers Road, if the speed limit can be reduced in that area, like maybe 30 miles an hour in the village of Three Corners, maybe it can be the same all the way to Four Corners, right. just to lower that traffic so people have more reaction time coming out of Bowers Road, and it's going to put a lot of traffic on that road. Sure. Some yeah, people may possible. even go out of Lover's Lane and down Coochie Road just to avoid mm -hmm. coming out of there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I want to second that. Is that, yeah. is that possible to <coughs> tip the state really in there? Is it? Yeah. They yeah one thought is we could request again that, um, I forget the official name, the traffic caddy that shows people their speed in those areas. Um, and some, some electronic signage that actually might bring, mm -hmm. uh, bring folks' attention. And, you know, the state has sort of said, well, we're going to repair the one that they own. Maybe, maybe we get a response to sort of help us a little bit. But there is a safety issue. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Coming out of there. Mm -hmm. with, with the <clears throat> traffic pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Really. coming out of there, you feel like it's a little bit of you, rushing the leg. You got to look down the road, <laughs> down the road, but yeah. back, or don't want to look back, you head out, yeah. and there's somebody at, they're there, they're right there. Yeah. Um, not a lot of time to react for either yeah. vehicle. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's true. Carl? Yeah, um, I came here just because so I saw a bike ride branch on the, on the um, agenda, and I haven't paid attention for a while, so I'm here to catch up. But if I could I add a comment, um, so I've been trying to push for wider shoulders between three and four corners and a slightly lower speed limit, and that would address some of the concerns that were just talking about just now. Well, it is State Highway. I don't know how much influence we have. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking with people, um, such as John Kaplan up at Trans and um, Ross McDonald, and asking them what, what can be done about it. And they actually have a policy right now that they're out with any projects that are done on the road that where possible, they will put in through the wide shoulder. And um, right now, what we've got for lane width, the 11 foot lane width, is, is um, suitable for that, that uh, feeder road with a uh, 40 mile an hour speed limit. 
but it could be dropped down a little bit. Um, could go to a 35 mile an hour or so. And it can also get up a 10 and a half foot lane or a 10 foot lane. <clears throat> and I think it's justified between three and four corners because it is uh, one of our more densely uh, populated areas of town. So they would make that road less wide. They would stripe it differently so that yeah. more of it would be a shoulder? Yeah, it would basically be no cost. It's just restriping and then further in. Um, there are a few places where it could use an extra shoulder and that would be a cost. Um, the only other option they've told me is that the town could take over the road, but no towns in Vermont that I know of, such as I've heard the same situation going on in Bristol. Nobody wants, no towns take over the road. Um, but they can policy makers to listen to towns a little bit more. And um, so in Jasper, like two years ago, they had kind of a fiasco over the bridge that they could in and they um, have instituted a more open policy towards town input. Okay, we're going to move along. Thank you. So I guess we'll just move along to the budget talk first. So I made a few tweaks. I gave you a, um, a cover sheet um, in your packets to kind of show, this goes to what Martha put in the minutes, but I've got some of the differences or the changes that we did last meeting. Uh, and then what's in bold is some of the tweaks, and they're not very major tweaks, but uh, some smaller tweaks I made to the budget um, between last meeting and this meeting. What I want to point out is what's not on here is in the capital projects. I've been talking about a generator for the fire department and the highway garage, and we had, um, and we still intend to take twenty thousand dollars out of the fire department equipment reserve fund. That was kind of an original. Uh, <coughs> just a general estimate that uh, John got from. Uh, a person, the more definitive estimate for the um, um, generator is 31,000. That includes installation on a cement pad and um, connecting to two buildings um, as well. Uh, so what I did was, without changing the $60,000 in the capital projects, I simply delegated um, 11,000 of that 60 to the generator for the fire department slash highway garage. And and twenty thousand dollars will still come out of um, the highway department equipment reserve fund. So there's no monetary increase or decrease in the budget. It's just a matter of designating eleven of that sixty thousand dollars to the actual highway garage. Uh, and I'm still letting kind of John take the lead on that project um, and uh, the folks that he's working with. The folks that he's working with has done generators for some of the other fire departments in the area, uh, including, I believe, Woodstock and Weathersfield. Um, so that's one change that's not on this cover sheet that I did make to the actual budget. That's kind of just a delegating of that 60000 uh, I also um, added $5,000 to the professional uh, services and the legal expense. We had quite a bit of discussion on this at the, um, the very first um, meeting. However, the reason that I added the $5,000 is because um, the licensing fee for Nimric uh, went from uh, $1,500 to five grand, uh, and that is under the professional services fee. Um, Nimric has come under fire by several people, including the state of Vermont. Uh, Nimric is not only our accounting software that Martin uses in the finance department, but it is also essentially the assessing um, software that we use out of the assessing office. The state of Vermont is updating their software, which speaks to each of the individual towns. Right now, most towns in the state of Vermont, actually, let me put it another way, state of Vermont uses Nemeric for that. 
they put it out to bid. One of the reasons they put it out to bid after like 20 years is because Nimerick has not been keeping up with the times. And I will vouch that they're probably overly um, inexpensive. The only word I can think of is inexpensive, but um, overly reasonable as far as um, accounting softwares go. I'm not sure the increase in the licensing fee is where I would have tweaked certain things, but um, that's where they tweaked one of them. So it's no surprise, but um, for a licensing fee, it is a fairly big increase. So that's why I added the $5,000 to the professional services line item. And they were coughing. There really is not an alternative for other purveyors of software for county. There is, but they're out-of-state software companies, um, and they're more expensive. And so they wouldn't interconnect with the state as easily as... So the connectivity, so right now our Nimric <coughs> software, which is dual-purpose assessing software and our um, accounting software, I would be... Uh, my fearful on the state changeover is how well if they go to a non Nimric software and we keep our, I'm very interested in keeping Nimric as our accounting software, the ability for those two to talk to each other and that's still to be watched yeah. as to how successful they are with that. And Nimric is still in the running for, <coughs> to win that, R, or win that bid, but it's not, certainly not guaranteed. And I think the state would probably like to go with somebody else. Um, so it's it, it's kind of welcome, yet it isn't. You know, I never needed to do it. I'm not sure I would have done it there. There's other places that they charge, but um, um, also uh, the PHC of the UV. I know I'm going to forget what that is, but that is um, an appropriation. Um, Chuck, do you remember the, um, the Housing Commission of the Upper Valley? If Sarah was here, she would know. Um, the Public Health Council. Public Health Council, I'm sorry. Public Health Council of the Upper Valley successfully um, submitted a petition for $1,727. So I added that to um, the budget that had not been on the budget. Interestingly enough, Otter Queechee Health is on the budget for 2500 but they have had difficulty getting a petition into me. I've yet to see it. So we'll they're see. Working. They're working on it. They're working, they're working hard, yeah. So interesting to see where that comes out. But um, with the uh, Public Health Commission of the Upper Valley, um, uh, petition coming in uh, that is rightfully on the budget. It can still get voted down during town meeting, um, as can any one of these, and we adjust appropriately at town meeting day. We'll actually subtract out the actual budget and number. Um, the $220 for the select board is based upon the conversation last um, week, and the rec center membership is simply, um, I took it out of rep I actually put it into membership and took it out of rec center office equipment. It's just simple. I took it from one to the other within the rec center budget, so there's no difference. Um, the $500 doesn't make a difference. Um, I did take um, $1,000 out of the old home day budget. I actually upped that budget um, by two to $2,500. Um, I think I, I, I didn't need to up it by that amount, so I took $1,000 out. Um, also went through and felt as though we could take $500 out of the janitorial services based upon Matt, our conversation last time. And Damon Hall repairs, I felt also was over budgeted a little bit. So um, some pluses and minuses there. Um, comes down to um, a difference of uh, 5875 from the December 2nd meeting. So you're going to fix those minutes, Martha, but then I'm going to say that the increase is a 9.8% increase total at this point, um, up from the 9.59 that was last meeting. So, um, so it's now 9.8. So now 9.8, correct. Could I ask a question? Sure. 
about the budget item for the generator, did we look into the option of using backup batteries as opposed to a $30,000 generator or 60, whatever the amount was? I'm wondering if we looked into batteries as a backup. Uh, how would the batteries charge or run the uh, electric at, it, it, the answer is no. You'd have to talk to John, John on what kind of John Sanders, um, kind of letting him run that um, for the fire department and he's gonna, we're gonna connect the highway department as well. Um, but uh, the answer is no, I don't believe that um, John has looked into batteries at this point. as you know, for residences, the power company is advocating batteries as a backup and a lot of people in town have installed them. Do you need the solar though to go with the batteries? No. Oh, can you speak to that? Um, no, GMP is using Tesla batteries, Powerwall batteries, and they're set up to charge from the grid, but they can also be connected to solar, which I guess would um, link back to the previous attempt at putting solar on the fire station, but it doesn't have to be. Well, so the question is, if it doesn't need the solar, then it's something that John can look into. If they need the solar, my understanding is that the town can't can't um, net meter with two different separate yeah, companies. So we're already technically net metering with Jay Guerri on the hydro. So we we wouldn't be able to then net meter with the solar. So if you can do the batteries without the solar panels. Yeah, right. I suspect that's a viable option that you know we may want to tap John into. And the maintenance costs on batteries are much lower than the maintenance costs of running of maintaining. The What's the duration generation? of the battery so Can they handle a four-day event? Well, it depends on the number of battery uh, mm -hmm. modules that you yeah. install. I mean, for homes, they're often saying yeah. it is four days or more. Um, GMP's put in about a thousand batteries so far, and they found that one power wall is not quite enough for most homeowners' needs during an average year, but two power walls can about cover it. But these can be ganged together, right? So, mm -hmm. um, we have to gang up more to handle a uh, truck fire. But it would also make a statement that, you know, we're trying to be green, other than running, you know, depending on hydrocarbons. It's a very worthwhile to contact John to have a look into. I mean, I think since it's a safety issue as well, mm -hmm. the question is, there for, in my mind, is their duration. But are they, as, I mean, generators need a lot of maintenance, and if you have an event where there's heavy weather, there's always a possibility a generator won't even won't run. Yeah, that, I that's just heard with your comment about heavy maintenance. So, you know, new generators once a year change the oil. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think you will find that yeah. large installations like the Honest Company Hospital, they service them. Oh, well, I don't know anything about that scale. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but a good idea. So what, what is the life cycle of a, of a, it's a lithium battery for these? What, what happens, who takes them when they're done? Um, I think right now they're predicting about a 10 year life cycle and the manufacturers are still working on a recycling program. A few manufacturers do have something set in place, but it's limited. They, no, the batteries haven't been around for um, long enough to have a um, significant use of a recycling program. Um, I think that most standby generators have a monthly cycling that has to be done. Right, but that's not an automatic cycle. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. I'm not against it. I'm just curious about sure. what happens. It's a reason, very reasonable question. Mm -hmm. I'll pass the idea on to John. Thank you. Um, so everything else stayed the same. Uh, so it made um, total highway expenditures to be one million two hundred seventy-one thousand eight hundred eighty-six. Um, and the general fund to be one million eight hundred four thousand two hundred fifty-eight. Um, total expenditures on both sides. So.
So the tax rate, um, there's some different people in the audience tonight, but uh, the tax rate is slightly different than the actual um, percentage, um, overall percentage budgetary increase. If you take both the high rate and the general fund together, the increase is 6.64%. Um, the highway fund, obviously, um, we have an, an additional member budgeted for that department, so the biggest increase is there. Um, the increase in the highway department is 12.32%. The increase in the general fund is 2.97%. Um, again, the increase in the combined budget is 6.64%, although the tax increase uh, is 9.8%. And one of the reasons for that is because we have utilized um, surplus monies in the highway the last two years, and we're weaning off of that. So that's revenue that we need to raise um, in addition to any increase in expense. Um, and um, there's a little bit of a differential this year in the rec center um, revenues as well. Um, a lot of that's a budgetary differential between this year and last year, uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a reduction in revenues um, that creates the differential between it, the, the actual budgetary increase and the tax increase. The time for questions? Sure. Okay. Um, so I looked at, you mentioned rec center revenue versus rec center program expenses. Yep. And there's 133000 almost $134,000 difference. Is yep. that what you're referring to? Uh, no, um, but the difference, so I highlighted that during the budgetary discussion. So a part of the, um, the programs of the rec center include the pay salary for John and Jack. Thank you. Uh, right now, the revenue covers the programs it, does, it covers most of those um, expenses of the, uh, it covers the program expenses and a little bit of um, the salaries. I, since I have been here, and I think it's been confirmed to me that in the past, the policy of the town is is that the goal is to have the revenue offset the operational expenses, although the director and the assistant director have not been a part of that. I would say the caveat is that the town or the school pays budgeted to pay twenty four thousand of Jack's salary. And we talked a little bit about this either last meeting or the meeting before. Um, we'll probably need to, I don't think there's any real formal policy as to what the school is to pay for Jack. I think that this dates back to the early days of the rec center um, when we were trying to get um, Ray Sap in place. If not, there may have been somebody before Ray Sap and back in the early 2000s. I think that the school kicked in a, an amount at that point in time to get things kind of up and running, and they've kicked in a, a, an amount since then. But I, you know, it's gone up. I don't know if it's gone up proportionally with what the town does for the school, but it has gone up a little bit over the last three years. I've upped that four or five thousand um, dollars, you know, over the past three years. Um, I think that they could probably pay more um, based upon what Jack does over there um, for the school programs. Um, I think that that's going to be a sensitive topic. I think obviously police enforcement will come back to us as far as part of that conversation. But um, I think ultimately that just needs to be a little bit clearer. But um, so what I'm talking about as far as revenues go, um, let me just see if it's apparent on the sheets that I gave you. Um, if you look at the if you look at the cover sheets for the general fund, so. 
So budgeted in fiscal year 2020, we budgeted 152,750 for, for revenue. And this year we're budgeting 137,400. So that's a good 3740, so like $15,000 less. Mm -hmm. So I think that a part of that is, is for a while there was an upward trend. So for instance, look at fiscal year 2018, it was 160,000 actual revenue. So I think from a budgetary, you know, but we only budgeted 135. So we kind of saw what we thought was an upward trend and we budgeted for that, but um, it kind of capped out. If not, it's kind of gone down a little bit. So, um, you know, most of that is kind of a difference between what we budgeted for revenue this year and what we're budgeting for revenue. Uh, what we budgeted last year and what we're budgeting for this year is there's just differentials. So obviously that lost revenue is like adding 15,000 in expenses. Um, but I don't see it as being, um, if you look at the long five, 10 year trend, I think it's in line with where the rec center has been. Does that make sense? No. Yes. <laughs> you can, uh, I can speak that a different way if it doesn't make sense. But um, it's simply this year we budgeted $15,000 less than last year for rec center revenue. Mm -hmm. So when you have a loss in revenue, you need to make that up in, in essentially tax revenue. So a loss of revenue is almost like an increase in a $15,000 increase in expenses. Mm -hmm. So if you combine the decrease in revenue, budgeted revenue in the rec center, along with the fact that we're using $45,000 less in highway surplus, mm -hmm. you know, $60,000 less in revenue, that we budgeted this year compared to last year. So that creates a need to increase taxes because it's lost revenue. Um, but the use of the surplus money wasn't, isn't really revenue to begin with, so it just helped. Right. Yeah. So, all right, I've got another question. So yeah. under total miscellaneous expense, fiscal year 20 was 13,000. Yep. Fiscal year 21 is 38. Correct. So, and again, you gotta go back to the original budgetary discussion. Um, so you should also see under total assessments, you see a decrease. So last year it was 382,465. It went down to 368,609. So part of that was is that we don't have the 21 house debt anymore, which is, you know, we were making a yearly payment of 38,000. I took 25,000 of that 38 and put it towards miscellaneous and said, look, we now own the Blake property. I think we're gonna have to clean something up there. So you've got $25,000 for Fort Brook Road in there that we didn't have under miscellaneous last year. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. That's all. Um, just a small tidbit, um, I had already put it together and I told James I, I really don't think it's going to affect the budget at all, but he came to me and he needed like $600 more, um, it's actually more like nine, but uh, the 300 will be under this year's budget. Um, based upon a new state, I'll call it a standard um, policy, I guess it's a law, they need to track um, basically it's a racial profile. <laughs> they need to track when he writes a ticket or whenever he pulls somebody over. Um, they need to make a detailed, you know, they need to keep track of male, female, black, white, brown. 
um, kind of a deeper interior profile when they pulled over. Apparently, this is to keep track of whether the police are profiling. You know, if a certain police officer or department is pulling over an unbalanced, you know, it's all females per se, you know, they may, you know, it's going to stick out and, and may raise a red flag. But um, he needs the software uh, and the capability to, you know, so he's not going through $1,200, you know, 1200 tickets at the end of the year and trying to do it by hand. His actual software. Software and being able to have his computer do it, um, it's going to total about $600. We only had a small increase in there. I felt as though the increase is going to take care of it, or I think that the $600 is easily absorbable somewhere. So I didn't mess with it, but just know he will need that um, at some point down the line. So if the if the software shows like all. Oh, Cars or from Massachusetts. <laughs> that problem. You know, I didn't ask him that. I just said, you know, I, I, I was a little suspect about the whole, you know. Uh, anyway, um, good question. That would be kind of, you know, I suppose you can then hire a couple constables and put them out there. Make a bundle off of our good friends. Oh, but I then, have noticed that uh, characteristic. And then Mike and BG may not be so happy with us, but uh, anyway, there's, there's pros and cons. I don't particularly like going through Plymouth, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, Plymouth? Is it Bridgewater? Bridgewater, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Bridgewater. Bridgewater is kind of a. Anyway. Yeah, they're productive. Both as a search department. <laughs> So what would you like? Approval? Uh, yes, please. Um, we need an official approval. Um, I think that um, as proposed, uh, a combined um, Expenses of three million seventy-six thousand one hundred forty-four dollars and thirty-two cents will suffice, unless you want to do approvals of both the highway and the general fund. This number right here. Did you say three million seventy-six? Three million seventy-six thousand one hundred forty. Four and thirty-two cents. Seems like a lot. I could make my snide comment about being twenty percent of the school budget. That's okay. I'm just going to ask you know what the number of the school budget is. Uh, I don't. Okay. You probably would question how much education you do. I. Uh, but that I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to poke too much fun out of it. Last I heard, it was very premature. It was like a month ago, I asked Nikki, Nikki Buck, and it was a very small increase at that point. I don't know if, uh, Martin, you've kept track of that at all? or hey, uh, I haven't seen much no, noise on it at all. Right. Um, the, land, the one thing I did see that caught my eye was the state, um, which essentially sets the property tax, um, was predicting like a 6% increase. Yeah. Um, but they, the last time they did that and they were kind of put out the red flag that it was going to be like an 8% increase, all the towns kept their spending really low and it ended up being a much smaller increase. But. Um, that's as much as I know. I, I think the school was looking at like a less than 2%. Um, but that was really early. That was like maybe before Thanksgiving. So the excitement is just yeah. rolling up. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, yeah, I see you're just running out there to make a motion, Mary, on that. If you wrote down the amount. What? I'll make a motion. <laughs> I make group. Sure. <laughs> I make a motion that the sub board approve the proposed fiscal year 2021 budget 
of three million seventy six thousand one hundred forty four dollars and thirty two cents. Does that suffice as an adequate motion? I'll second the adequate motion. <laughs> Discussion? Yeah. Any further discussion? No. I don't. Any do you? Thoughts, I got a lot of, a lot of thoughts, but. Yeah. <laughs> what to do? Inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Tax rate. Do we have a estimate on that? Well, our raising municipal tax rate nine point eight percent. So yeah, on your handout. Um, so this is just municipal, not school. Yeah. So if you have a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, um, it would be a hundred twenty three dollar one hundred twenty three dollar differential between this year and last year. How big a house? 250,000 would be a $123 differential. Um, I've got, and again, this is just municipal. So on 250 last year, um, uh, let me just make sure I get this right. So actually, you would have paid 1,254. This year, you paid 1,377. Difference $123 or 9.8%. Driver there being on the highway. Um, if you're just paying taxes, $94 differential between this year and last year. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, yep, uh, on a $250,000 house, general fund would be a $29 differential between this year and last year, and $250,000 house, equally $123. Thank you for good with us. I think everybody's depressed and we're very quiet tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. We're good. Intersection project. So we've got in, in our packet we've got some numbers. A couple of pages stapled together. And Dave can explain. 
bring this one on the mic. And the first page is the project as it would have been originally. And the second page is what the project has kind of evolved to, um, not including the idea of bearing wires, but otherwise with the additional sidewalk and the grants and uh, two grants and uh, more engineering than we had counted on and so forth. And the bottom line, we at the bottom, is the overage of what we have thought it was going to cost and what it's actually projected to cost. So, do you want to explain it, Dave, a little more line by line? Uh, yep. So, last <coughs> meeting, you started to, Mary brought up some questions and it's the, we had ultimately kind of started a conversation on this. <coughs> and so, I went back um, and kind of spent some time with it um, to make sure that um, we're all on the same page. And um, there was a little bit of a surprise to me on the grant part of this, um, but in going through it, um, it does make sense um, to me quite a bit. So the bad news here, um, let me just stick with the grant part of the three corners intersection with the bike pad grant. Um, the bad news here is that we're still um, underfunded for this. So we're essentially underfunded almost identically whether we have the bike pad grant money or not. That's the, and I shouldn't say that, that's kind of the bad news. The good news in this is that with the bike pad grant, portion of this were positioned much better. So in the price breakdown that I've got for you, since we've got the bike ped money, I've got um, a, a full estimate for construction engineering above and beyond anything that we've estimated before. Uh, it also includes sidewalk from the post office to the library that um, the original budgeting that I, I've also got included here does not. Um, and it does include municipal project management uh, money as well. Um, and we kind of end up in the same place. The part that threw me for a loop between where my mind was and after I put these monies together, you'll see I kind of hand wrote on this um, the bike ped grant reimbursement after expenses of $223,085. We were essentially awarded $269,600. Again, there's some good news and bad news here. The bad news is, is that the amount we were awarded, the 269600 is based upon a reimbursement amount for design engineering. And we've actually already done most of our design engineering. So the $40,000 of grant reimbursement is really non-reimbursable because we've essentially done that design work. So the, the, the numbers I've got here, utilize the grant reimbursement money, the 223085. So that's the bad news. The good news is, is that as we continue to do design engineering or if we have overages on anything else that is pertains, essentially the sidewalks that pertains to the, the bike ped, then we've got $40,000 available essentially in grant reimbursement to use. So it's not like it just goes away. They've actually awarded us $269,600 that's available provided that we make appropriate expenditures and they'll reimburse us 80%. And that's kind of convoluted, but uh, hopefully that makes sense. So, um, 
it is good from this respect that if we go have any overages or any increased design work, which we will pertaining to the sidewalks, we've got grant money in there to, to, to as, as prices or, or expenses may increase. Um, it can't be used for the $91,000 in design engineering that we've already done. So, um, and when we put the budget together, we said, this is the, the amount of the project, this is 20% of this is design engineering, and 80% of that would be grant reimbursable. That's why the grant, the award is higher than, at the moment, what would actually be usable for grant money. <coughs> I didn't get that. <laughs> the other thing I don't get is it says project overage is forty six thousand. Yep. So that means to me that's a negative. Like, a, yeah. So at the moment we you know we would need to make up somewhere forty six thousand oh, dollars, okay. and we'll probably need to make up more as we progress a bit here. So you know as today. If we were to do this and everything were to come under in on budget, we would be about fifty thousand dollars short. But didn't you say we had put in like forty six thousand of uh, the grant? It was related to the sidewalk. Yeah. So if we would need to so oh, 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 oh. So you only get the grant reimbursement provided that you make expenditures on certain things. Yeah. So as I've got this written out, the expenditures are in there as with the 80% grant reimbursable on what's reimbursable, which gives us $223,085 in, in reimbursable expenses or, or money the state will give us back. Mm -hmm. So I've got that in here, mm -hmm. okay? So with that grant reimbursement included, we're still about $50,000 short. So the positive is, is that if we continue to expend more and we expend more on say sidewalks or, or engineering on sidewalks or something like that, 80% of that would be picked up by the $40,000 we have left over or, or we at the moment can't use because when we asked for the grant, we said, oh, you know, X amount would be for design engineering. We've already done that. So we can't go back and get reimbursement at this point for the work that's already been done. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So the wild card here between this budget, and again, a certain percentage of this is grant reimbursable, um, but the other sheet, let me back up for a second. So you've got another sheet here that is what I've been giving you for the last two years, and these numbers have essentially been what I've been giving you for the last two years. Prior to the grant money, this shows a total overage or underfunding of about $14,000, mm -hmm. okay? However, that doesn't include sidewalks from the post office to the library. What's also not included in that overage is there was a moment, ironically, when I came on and Bob left, that VHB came to us and said, oh, by the way, I don't think the engineering, you know, for the construction is going to be 10 grand. I think it's going to be more like 50 grand. Um, there was, in our contract, there was construction engineering but it proposed estimated amount of like 10 grand. We're gonna have like pathways do it, subcontract it out for $10,000. I don't see that happening. Um, so anyway, if you take the minimum amount that they were saying, yeah, 40 to $50,000, let's just take 40 grand that's not in these numbers, and you add that to the 13, 14, that puts us at 54, 55. And the difference between that 40 and 50 and the number I've got over here on this one of 76 is essentially in working with the state of Vermont, particularly on the grant programs, they use kind of a blanket estimate that the construction engineering is about 15% of the total project cost, which is how I got the $76,000 number. If you take 15% of the 450,000, which is the project without the sidewalk from the post office to the library, 
the engineering cost would be like 67,000. So the problem here is, is we don't really know what that construction engineering cost is. If it's less than, if it's in the $40,000 range, we're looking pretty good. And we're, you know, these are old numbers, but we, we're looking much better. If it's in the $76,000 range, then it poses a problem. And 76 seems high, but certainly 40 seems low. Um, you know, this is, I, you know, I think there's a vast difference between what maybe the town and BHB conceptualized this actually doing and at the end of the day, I mean, I think that as we went through the 1111 permit process, I think it became apparent to at least BHB that this was going to be, it was going to have to be done at a certain level of quality that maybe. Just looking at the engineering costs for the uh, base hill culvert. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a reality check that these are very well. Yeah. A little bit of different as design work, but um, it's that's a yeah. the Mace Hill culvert's a fairly easy project, yeah. you know, technically. You know, it's got some complexities, which is why we need the design work, but yeah, that's okay. you know, upwards okay. to forty grand. Okay, just to make sure that I understand this. This either the original budget or this new budget with the um, Bike head grant still does not have any um, budget for overage for project overage. So we're still vulnerable if we start the project and yeah. there's a cost overrun. Yeah. Okay. And then part two is there's still no funding for any landscaping or hardscaping of the new green space. Um, the answer to that is no, there's no landscaping expense that I know of. So let me, so let me back up again to where the conversation was started to go last week. So, um, so what we have in front of us now, you, you see where the original project is. So we talked about, and I've gone out and solidified design work. So we were asked to consider bearing utilities. Okay. So we're in the process of doing that. Design work is almost finished. There's one more important question that Green Mountain Power needs to answer. Um, and then it will go to the utilities for final estimates. So we need to put that to the voters. That's essentially what we told this group of people that we would do. This is kind of what we've embarked. Um, if we put that to the voters, it would be, do the voters want to bury the utilities at a cost of, I'm just gonna say a million dollars, which would be the underlying project, which is about $500,000, more than that, but you got the grant money and all that good stuff. Another $500,000 to bury, completely bury the utilities. We've asked for a second alternative, but it was to stick with what we know. So we need to, in my mind, take that step, okay? So if we take that step, the costs to us at this point are relatively good expenses and, and estimates that we've got or will have when we get the estimates back from the utility companies as a whole. And we can add a contingency and you know make sure that to the best of our knowledge today, borrow enough money to cover the underlying project and the utilities. So that's relatively how it works and relatively straightforward and, and if they say yes, then you proceed with the borrowing, you got the money, you do the project, we continue as is. If they say no, so it comes back to kind of what we've been talking about for two years. I kind of said we didn't need to do it last time, but looking at these numbers, I think you need to at least have the conversation. It, it becomes a lot more complex. If they say no to the utilities, then you've got the underlying project, but you're 
50 to 75 thousand dollars short on the project. So do you want to go back to the voters and say, you know, we'd like to, you know, borrow for more than five years, and it's not 450; it's more like 550 and do that route, or you can continue with the project and manage or deal with a 50 to 100,000 or 50 to 75,000 overage and kind of go that way. So, you know, going straight forward is somewhat straightforward, but, um, you know, ultimately, if we don't do the utilities, we kind of need to just understand where we are and how we want to proceed. You know, if they were to say no to the utilities, no to that borrowing, um, how do we want to proceed? I don't know how I think you got to do one at a time. I think you got to, it's way too, I, I, you can't ask them, do you want to borrow for project A, this amount, but you know, if that doesn't happen or you don't vote to approve that, you're going to go with B for this amount, and if you don't do that, then the underlying project still stays and we do something else. Yeah. So you got to go forward and simply, you know, ask, you know, put the project forward. Say, you know, we're proposing project with utilities for a million dollars to be borrowed over X amount of time, and see what the voters say. You know, again, if they say no to that, the underlying project, it would be worded that the underlying project stays. But then the board would then need to decide whether you want to confuse the heck out of everybody and ask them, you know, for borrowing for another amount for the original project or whether you want to move forward and kind of manage it from that perspective. So. But the only thing that looks good on this horizon is that the interest rates are really low. The interest rates are low. This, this bank thing is Vermont. Uh, if we borrow, I mean, yeah. Dave has it. There's a three point something and three point something. Yeah. So these interests, so, and again, this, so we've had, we've actually kind of had these conversations before. So these are from last year and last year's interest rates. So weirdly enough, the economy is very good, yet the interest rates went down. Um, so the interest rates from last year have gone down. I gave this to you, and again, I only gave you the million dollar, $960,000 amount. <laughs> Simply to, there was some discussion on, well, how long would we borrow for? Mm -hmm. um, and let me just give you kind of a quick spiel on that. Um, you know, a lot of times I hear from this board, we kind of dwell on the expense of borrowing, the interest rate, which is a piece of the equation. It's a very important piece of the equation. That's why I would not recommend the 30-year borrowing. I think that the 20-year borrowing is sufficient. It's also a lot more expensive to borrow for the 30. Um, but, you know, people that are going to lend you money are going to do it to get money back. You know, they're gonna lend you money for 20, 30 years and they expect a return on that, so there's gonna be an expense. The only alternative is, is you keep a million dollars in your pocket on hand so that you can spend it and you don't have to borrow. So there is an expense, you do want to keep that in mind. However, there is also, you know, your cash flow or your depreciation or, or how you want to expense this over time. And part of what I have heard is, do we want to pass this to our kids 30 to 40 years from now or whatever? My little blurb on that is if we were a utility in front of the Public Service Board, they would essentially have us borrow at the, um, the life of the, the, the asset, and that would follow kind of the depreciation of the asset. Um, to a point, they're not gonna allow you to borrow and pay back over 60 years. If it's something that's gonna hang around for 60 years, it's gonna be like a 30-year payback. 
but they don't want you paying back in five years for an asset that's going to last 30 either. And the reason for that is because this public service board is also looking out for the taxpayer or the rate payer. And if the payback is too quick, it's going to increase that expense and create some hardship for the rate payer. We're not too different, we have a taxpayer. So granted, it's going to be more expensive for us to borrow and maybe even borrow over long term, but you gotta look at how it affects your yearly payment as well. Um, if it is too quick, a five, 10 year payback, it's going to be $100,000 know, over 10 years, million dollars. If it's over 20 years, it's half of that. So consider your ability to pay as well and what that does to your budget and your payback. Um, another way to put it, you know, Matt, I'm going to assume that if I was doing your taxes, you know, you buy a piece of equipment, um, if you write that off in a shorter period of time, uh, it's good for your taxes because you're going to make less because you, know, as you depreciate that over five years compared to 15, your expenses are higher and you pay less in taxes. If I'm looking at this from a business and I'm not interested necessarily in my tax bill, but I'm interested in you know my bottom line for my shareholders or something, uh, depreciation may be over 30 years, and uh, I have a greater return, a greater you know revenue over expenses, um, giving me a better bottom line. So companies look at paybacks and depreciation and write-offs um, depending on what it is you're trying to do. We're borrowing here and ultimately you gotta figure out, you got certain different things that you have to consider. The, the price of the interest is one of them, but also you know, too short of a payback is going to really constrain you and too long of a payback is unnecessary. So that's my spiel on this. Well, that's a fixed rate. Uh, it is most, uh, it's an average fixed rate, so it's a, it, it's going to have some fluctuations in there, but it is 3.89% over the span of 20 years. Can I ask a question? Yep. I'll into that. I'm curious, you talk about payback, and I'm curious, uh, even the other things we've talked about, like the highway budget, what would be the town's potential for payback on this project? In other words, does the town have any opportunity to earn income to offset its expenses in this project? Um, the short answer is no. Um, I would prod you a little bit as to, um, you know, where, from a governmental service point of view, where you feel as though we could charge something for the service that we're providing. Well, when you compare it to other investments we make, like the fire trucks have a payback because it saves property, hopefully, and the dump trucks and the grader and everything have a payback, and that enables all of us to uh, make more efficient use of our, of our travel. But I'm just wondering, in this particular project, can we anticipate that the town receives any kind of revenue stream, you know, short of putting in a toll booth? For, for this project to offset, because I think it's my perception that in all the investments that you make for the town, there is the anticipation of things balancing out in some way. I think the investment would be the, it's a safety, We're considering safety and then bearing the utilities, the intent by the people who asked us to consider it was that we make it more, the town center more attractive to people traveling through and perhaps thinking of settling here. So I would agree, I, I think that, um, you know, so there's no, you know, it's almost a justification, okay, we're going to justify spending $500,000 for a fire truck because it's going to save somebody's $200,000 house. Um, I don't think it's quite, you know, let's come back to, you know, the snow plow or the grader, um, you know, grader's a $200,000 investment. 
you know, what you get is, you know, hopefully better roads. Um, that, serve, that serve everybody. Right. Um, it would it serves the users of the road. Yeah. So this would also serve the users of the road in that um, I think that my understanding, it predates me, but the reasoning for this was both for a pedestrian, a more pedestrian friendly intersection, a safer intersection, it alleviates, you know, you go from eight stop signs, seven, eight stop signs, with four. Um, it kind of brings things together. So I think that the justification here would be, you know, the investment is to make for a safer intersection. I've also heard, um, and including the safe route to school, you know, that school kids can get from the school to the library now in a much more coherent way. Um, and I think part of this conversation that I've heard is also, um, you know, aesthetically, um, it um, just makes for a neater, tighter entryway into town. So I think that that's... Well, that's pretty much just vanity. What's that? That's vanity. I think that's what it's called. I, I call it anything you want, I think, but, uh, you know, so I think that that affects the end of the day, I think that that... The rationale would be affects, you know, particularly the safety part affects the users of, you know, the intersection. And no, I was just curious part. though if, yeah. if there's. Uh, I guess my other question then would be from that is, should the taxpayers decide to nix the project or end the project? How we have gotten the grant for the bed, bed bike park, would that still continue to go forward? No. Sidewalk Chuck, we, we have a positive vote on doing the project oh, as, I understand as of 2014. Right, but it's over budget. And, and we, you know, with the grants, and uh, we have two grants that we didn't anticipate, uh, we're, we're only slightly over budget, and most of that is caused by um, you know, excessive engineering costs. Sure. Yeah. Carl? Um, Basically, where's the grant from? Which agency and what program? With one agency, transportation, bicycle, and pedestrian. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John Kaplan, as you mentioned, is the uh, oversees that. Okay, it's not from the community development for the centers of town. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there may, uh, there's some, obviously there's always tie-in in the state of Vermont with village and town designations. Um, they prioritize grants to anybody who has a village and town designation, so there's an extreme tie-in there. So in both instances, you know, this is a village designated area as well, so that played into the grant approval. <coughs> Chuck, just to go back to kind of what you said, you know, 50% of the sidewalk work is due to the intersection. Um, reconfiguration along with the crosswalks. Um, if that goes away, um, I'm not sure if the interest is there from the state. Um, and most of the effort on our behalf goes away as well, so I think that um, it would probably go away. Um, maybe the sidewalk from the post office to the library could stick, but I think the rest would go away. So Dave, what do you think that the bond interest would be this year? Because this was this rate was previous years. Still low. I thought you said it would be lower. Um, interest rates have gone down, so I'm. I can only assume that it would be lower than this. Yeah. Um, I can't give you. I'd have to. I haven't done that because we're not there. I'm not going to have them draw up a, a, a schedule at this point in time just because I don't have the, the concrete numbers I'd like to have. But um, it hasn't gone down. It might go down by maybe a few tenths or it wouldn't go down by a whole percent. I think they've gone down two or three times this year since last January. I know they've gone down at least twice. Whether it's been a quarter point or not, I can't say. Thank you. So we're still waiting on the 
utility side of this. And it's January the 7th, 6th. Can we pull it off? So I spoke to Dan Peck today, and he said he's awaiting the, the response from Green Mountain Power to put it out and try and get responses back from the utilities as soon as possible. Um, in order to put this to an actual bond vote um, for March, we'd have to warn this by February 6th. Um, I have been pushing very hard to have this to us at this point in time uh, so that um, it can be warned for February 6th and go to town meeting day. Um, at this point in time, being January 6th, we have not sent it out to the utilities. Um, that gives us about three weeks to get it out to the utilities, get it back, make the decisions on the interest rate, et cetera. Um, we've gone almost an entire year trying to get this information. At this point in time, I would make sure that we do it right. Um, and I would say that, um, that we don't have it for February 6th. Um, perhaps we have that information for an updated town meeting day, but I would, I would shoot for a time that works well with the town, uh, Clyde. Um, it would be an Australian ballot vote. And um, you know there will be some instances upcoming with votes that would need to be done with Australian ballot, so maybe try and tie it in with that. Um, but I would wait at this point in time to make sure that we've got our I's dotted and T's crossed. There will be a lag time with the NEPA process, the National Environmental Policy Act. This process with the state, or it's actually, the bike ped money is actually federal money, which is why we go through some of the hoops. Um, there will be a lag time with that, um, which I think will allow us to go to a vote with the utilities um, and then pull the two. Essentially, right now there's essentially two projects. Um, utilities being almost a more complex project than the underlying project was, um, allow us to pull these two together and, and kind of put them on the same track. Um, I think the goal here, at least in my mind, was to have this for town meeting. Um, I think that, um, one, I don't think the, I don't have 100% confidence in the utilities, and two, I think it's just smarter to make sure that we, we're good with the info. And the, the, the sidewalk portion and the road portion, are they ready to be put up to bid without the, if we, we didn't do the utilities? What we have held up on is um, the 1111 permit, um, of which I can't remember her name, um, is fairly in tune to this project and has seen it once or twice. The tweaks that needed to be done after we received responses from the last time we submitted for the 11-11 permit have been put into place. Um, so I think that we could minus the utilities and minus, you know, if you didn't want to do the bike pad grant and, and so additional. The, the grant will take. The grant will add grant. time. So if we don't do the utilities, I've been saying that we needed to go I guess back. That answers my question yeah, okay. more than anything about okay. the grant. So with the grant, we need to back up and go through um, the process of historic review, archaeology review, and wildlife review. Um, of which I don't think there'll be an issue here. We looked at that to a smaller degree when we had the state funding for Queechy Road. Um, it just wasn't as inclusive as this will ask us to be, and we need to incorporate the entire work section here. So we need to go back and do that before we can go forward. Could you start that now? We will start that in the near future. Um, it'll be one of the next steps that we take. Um, but I understand once it's like a six to eight month review process with federal government. So it'll put us into the fall anyway. So, so if you have a vote somewhere in there. So we will need to bring VHB into and identify certain things on this and submit it to um, 
I'm actually not sure which agency you submit for. This is categorical exclusion from the National Environmental Policy Act. Not exactly sure who reviews it, but uh, we need to send the people that actually review it. So on a positive note, if I could throw it out there. So, when I came on, we needed to address easements, um, two very big ones, um, two very important players in this project, being Matt Dunn and um, Bill from BGS. That has been taken care of. Um, they are on record and in place. As part of that discussion with Bill and Mike from Mike's and Matt Dunn, the response that we got was they would prefer to see this done as one project and not two. So without the utilities, they were saying, okay, but we don't want you doing the intersection and you coming back in a year or two and digging up and doing the second part of the sidewalk. That's just going to create heartache for everybody and we just go through it twice. It wipes out two summer you know, intersections. So I believe we've taken care of that with the bike ped grant and we've got the that inclusive. Um, and there was also a very high desire for us to consider the utilities of which we have got a utility design and we will have some pretty concrete estimates to turn around and legitimately look the public in the eye and say, this is a proposal, this is the cost, this is what would be done. Two alternatives, I think the select board will need to decide one. I don't think you can go with two, I think you need to go to the public with one. So we got some strong feedback, we have addressed it, we put the pieces in place, and you've got the easement signed and, and in place as well. So there is excruciating as slow as this feels, some of this work is not, you know, something that you can just knock on a door and somebody's going to say, oh yeah, you know, power to you, you know, you can reconfigure my driveway, I don't mind. Um, you know, we've addressed all that and, and we've had some good discussions and I think that that's been, you know, I think that for the most part the players are on board, um, but you need to continue to let this play out. Much like I have the last two years, I will continue to say, you know, you're underfunded by about 50 grand. So what's the action part of this discussion? Uh, Is there one? After I did all this, I came to the conclusion that I think the action is simply no action in that we wait, that the action is not that we try and put this to the voters at town meeting day. Perhaps we give them an update if we have the numbers at that point in time. I feel very strongly at this point that it will not be, you know, it's something that you can have a special meeting for. I think we'll have the information in a couple months. I just don't think you're gonna have it for February 6th. So at this point, there is no action. around the corner, the same as we have now here, only it's going to be moved, sidewalk around the, you know, if you looked at the map, it would be helpful, but sidewalks, um, all the sidewalks will be part of the grant rather than yeah. paying, paying for it. The only, place the only place there won't be a sidewalk, I think, is next to Matt's um, building. It, it kind of stops at the corner of his building. So there's, um, yeah. and out front of yeah. these stairs is all going to be redone. Yeah. 
So there's really the bike part of the bike pad isn't well, in there. <laughs> well, you get to stop at the stop sign along with the cars. It's more the pen than the bike. <laughs> it's more the pen than the bike. Yeah. 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 It also delineates four crosswalks, four distinct crosswalks. So if you're biking into the village um, on Route 5, uh, or let's just say you take Carl's Route 12, you want to cross over on Route 5, it makes for a heck of a lot easier bike ride than what we've got now. Okay, thank you. Will it also include illuminated stop signs like you see in Quichi on Route 4 by the gorge? Couldn't tell you. Nothing like that. I don't know. So that pedestrians have an option to call for a, a warning when they want to cross? I don't know. Call for a what? Well, as you know, in Quichi and in many places, if a pedestrian wants to cross, you can press a button and the light starts to flash. And it blinds traffic. The last time I went through Quichi, the light was flashing constantly. <laughs> so so I left their finger. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. So, with no action, I think I'm isn't it? That's about it, isn't it, Dave? That's, I don't that think and then some. Discuss that forever. Yeah. So let's move on on our agenda. Uh, next thing is that we do not have a moderator from town meeting or the school meeting. And I don't know that we even have a name of someone who would like to be appointed. So we're kind of not a moderator. Are you interested, Tom? Well, thank you. There goes my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened to the moderator? She didn't run. Oh. <laughs> she didn't run last time. It would have been last. No, ran. no one ran. <laughs> Jennifer Grant. Uh, we had. Uh, there were a couple of people. There were some write-ins. Besides, uh, Pat had quite a few write-ins, but there were some others. Were you interested, Ron? No. But Pat got almost enough to win, didn't she? Yeah. <laughs> she did? Yeah. It was close. Five votes or something. That's all she needed. <laughs> yeah. Well, the idea was that she didn't want to yeah. do it anymore. We don't have other ideas. So, I don't know where we are with that. If you were to have any inside pull, I think part of the problem last year was that I don't think it got advertised originally as being an open position. And I don't know if it was very well known until maybe the week of town meeting. Um, mm -hmm. If you could maybe pull her out of retirement for one more go and allow somebody to be elected in, it might be. None of the other names were interested? I don't recall. I think I remember Matt Dunn's name being tossed around. Um, I don't recall who was. We, I could ask Clyde if he still has the write ins. Well, at this point, we'd have to appoint somebody, right? You can, yeah. yeah. So it would be for the one and then whoever's elected. Yeah. And this person can run for however long. So could we, um, could we advertise on the listserv for names or do you not want to give them? Uh, I think we've got a few names. I think we should ask them before we. Do you remember anybody here? One of the problems is that at this point it's, it would be pretty hard for someone to get up to speed unless they had some experience. Well, I think Matt can handle it. Yeah, I'd throw in Dan Nelson's name in because he who lives, Dan Nelson, who lives in Harlem now, he was a moderator in Hanover for a couple of years. Um, but I think he still has bullet holes in him from during the Hanover. Yeah. He's a little reluctant to Hanover and Hartland. Yeah, different, different states, different towns. She would. Yeah. Don't want to jump out there with her because it just kills the other. Yeah. Would you ask that person? I could. Yeah. Yeah. 
I didn't get a real big thank you from him when I said it. Oh, you've already mentioned it. What do you think about that? Done. He's done it. I don't. I think he. No, no, I think he said no. no. He said no. We asked. I asked him just a few days ago. Okay. Yeah. 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 Getting up to speed with Robert's rules of order is, is pretty serious. You know, Clyde knows it pretty well, so he could. Oh, he'd be happy to correct people. Yes, he would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, when is the training with the BLCT? You know, I lost my little card or threw it away? Or I want to say like the first week of February. Okay. Not the last week of February. It's coming up. Which was the Robert Rules of, of Order for town meeting? Uh, it's just a incorporate a few things. It's, it's like the town meeting tune-up thing, and it goes over. It's essentially for town moderators. It kind of goes over moderator position and, and stuff like that. Well, uh, Pat will do it again. I asked her again tonight <laughs> before I came down. She said she would. She said she would do it one more time. Uh, but uh, it would be better if we could find somebody else. Or at but, least find somebody who would run. Yes. I mean, Dave's suggestion is, is perfectly logical, and I don't know why the whole year went by and weren't able to do that, to make, make that happen. And I don't know that we will be any more successful this year. But, yeah. um, that's, you know, we certainly struggled with the Board of Civil Authority as to who wanted to share that or run that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. The good news is I think Pat's pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. so. Well, what about the idea of something on the listserv that describes the duties and specifies familiarity with the Roberts Rules of Order. Maybe there's someone out there who has that skill. Is that a, is that a good option? Well, Jennifer Grant expressed some interest in it, and I asked her again about it um, a few weeks ago. She said she's still thinking, I guess, or something like that. So I don't know. Well, I, I think where that is. knowing that there's upcoming training would give some people, anyway, some confidence. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would, I would like to put on the list, sir. Yeah. Because we only know a fraction of people in time, right. sure. and the same people over and over, and maybe there's somebody who could who'd be perfectly happy to step up, take the training boom, participate in town, do their civic duty, and serve the town well. So. It's not hurt. I don't think it would hurt. And, and put that information about the when the training is. Yes. Are you offering to write it? I am offering to write it. So you're saying to me before you send it out. Okay. 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 If you do a lot of heavy editing, though, it'll be deeply insulted. So. Oh, uh, I know that. That's not bad. That. That's not bad. That's before we want to. Probably the same thing. What did you think of? What? Nothing. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Let me just send you when that when that seminar is. If you have ready access to it, yes. I quick access. I don't know if it's ready. I can quickly access it. Ready and quick. Same. Ready is like it's right there. It's not quite right there. <laughs> Got to press a couple buttons. I can send it to you. <coughs> so why not send this to you? 
Okay, so you can approve it. All right. You better just rubber stamp it. Okay, let's move on. Okay. this over and on. We'll talk about the Maceo Culver. I know we already have. We'll talk a little bit more. Um, um so okay. uh, so back in um, back in November, we put this out to bid um, for engineering services. They came back in December 10th. Uh, we got four responses, one from Otter Creek Engineering, one from Stantec, one from Du Bois and King, and one from Pathways Consulting. Uh, right before Christmas, Matt, uh, myself, and Bill Barrows met um, to go over these. We read um, these. I gave you abbreviated, I didn't give you the entire packages. They get into all the people that work for the company and different bios and this, that, and everything else. So he essentially gave you the nuts and bolts of the proposal. Um, Matt, myself, and uh, Bill uh, felt as though not only was Otter Creek the lowest um, proposal at, uh, their proposal without borings was at about 23,100. Um, everybody else was upwards in the high 38. 39.43. Um, he did get back to me today um, on the borings. Um, I've got here an estimated three. It's going to be three, four, green. I didn't see the amount that he's estimated, but um, <coughs> brings it up to about 26.27. Uh, I did speak to uh, Scott Jensen, um, the state uh, stream management engineer uh, who has worked with various companies, including Otter Creek, uh, and he did read their proposal, um, felt as though Otter Creek <coughs> does fine, felt as though the proposal was sufficient. Um, Chris Bump also um, felt as though Otter Creek would be the wiser um, of the four. Uh, so the um, overall uh, decision of this group was Otter Creek Engineering um, for the services. Um, I think that there's been enough legwork here. I think at this point, essentially just kind of passing this on for informational purposes. If the board feels any reason to have any real concerns about it, I think you can voice it, but I think that uh, you know the group kind of did its job there. Yeah. Uh, I, in, this is a question of bigger matter today. Um, <coughs> I think it's Pathways proposal that they talk about a fourth option of Culver that was introduced by uh, Vtrans. And, and, um, and Otter Creek's proposal says we've got the three and those are the only three you're going to do. So what has Chris Bumps introduced from VTrans, because he's the one that was mentioned, that um, has Pathways concern about the design that they only heard about, the other guys didn't hear about? So no, I think uh, Otter Creek addresses it. Uh, I think that um, the... RFP, and that didn't go out to the board, um, if the RFP um, states that uh, the hydrology study makes recommendations, strong recommendations, that this needs to be 10 foot wide, or two seven feet, feet high, yeah. bury two feet, make it a five feet high. Um, we were very clear in the RFP that we feel as though there's constraints here with this waterway and that to hit 10 feet wide by the seven feet high may be extremely difficult. So that they need to consider the constraints of the stream as well as the hydrology study. So we want this as wide as it can be based upon however wide it can be. Uh, I think that Pathways addressed that in their first paragraph stating that. Yeah, I also think Otter Creek answered that question. I don't think the other two did. I, I went back to read Otter Creek twice and that was, I didn't see that. I, so it was only just a, you know, I only, I kept reading in two or three places, we're just doing three, we're just doing three. Uh, so, 
So there's more to it than just doing, so Otter Creek mentions they're gonna look at, you know, concrete versus, you know, half of a tube for lack of a better term. Yeah. The RFP is actually a little bit more uh, basically stating that we, you need to look at the constraints of the stream as well as the hydrology study. So whatever they do for it, so actually Pathways didn't, if I recall, and it's been three weeks now since I've read these thoroughly, I don't think Pathways said we're gonna look at three different designs. Um, I don't recall Pathways saying that. I think that Pathways did say that they would look at only because I spoke to Jeff Goodrich personally, he gave me a call on this, and I spelled yeah, out to him, to I spelled out to Jeff very clearly, okay. this is what you need to do. So I think that he was he regurgitated that in the first paragraph, which, and we each kind of marked this in discussion with Matt, I pointed this out to Matt. Um, Jeff, Pathways answers that, I felt as though Otter Creek did as well. I think where Pathways falls short, is that one, their hours were twice as much as the nearest competitor. And Pathways also didn't, their, their job history on these culverts was limited. So that dinged Pathways considerably compared to the other three. And Matt can jump in here any time. Yeah, one big plus about our Creek was they were gonna do some uh, construction visits. Oh, they're all, that's spelled out in all. No, the three of them were not. They oh, would for. Getting K has four. Those were just, four those were just shop drawings and they would, they would share. No, they have four site visits now. Wait, because I went back over that as well to make sure that they're, they're all. Oh. Um, so, um, and, sure. and where, where are they, oh, did you? Not all of them were though. Okay, I know some did differ as to, some said updating hours and some. <coughs> I, I haven't read this carefully, but I think one of the things that I think it was in Otter Creek talking about all the designs of culverts makes them taller, yeah. and they've got a problem keeping the road down. Right. But that's why the flat, right. the flat top the, makes a lot more sense. Situation on twelve is there. The flat top makes a lot more yeah. sense. Yeah. Now I'm not uh, disagreeing with your choice based on the cost as well as the overall proposal. What I am introducing is a variable that Mr. Bump seemed to have introduced that could throw, throw all these. I don't agree with that, actually, Phil. Okay, I, I, I convinced me. <laughs> I don't have I don't, I don't have theirs in front of me. Let me so specify what it is exactly. You know, in pathways. I, I just want to make sure you're the two of you spend time with all of this. That if you feel like that's not going to be an issue, then I'm, I'm fine with it. You know, I have one other issue with just getting the permitting. That was the other question about. So this is exactly per this is exactly per my conversation with with Chris Bump. I mean, I'm sorry with 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 um, Jeff Goodrich. So he says that we understand that the new culvert should be designed in accordance with the hydrology study that accompanied the RFP. However, from the RFP and a conversation with Chris Bump, we understand that the existing upstream and downstream site conditions may require a culvert size different than it is what is recommended by the h and study, but must be approved by Scott Jensen. Right. He's very specific on that. However, when I read the Otter Creek, I, I get the general sense of the same thing. Okay. So when I rated these, and we rated each one on a sheet of paper, mm -hmm. I rated pathways and Otter Creek very high for re for answering that, whereas Du Bois and King and Stantec specifically said we assume that it's going to be based upon the H and H study. And okay. I didn't, you know, I didn't ask further of them. You know, are you assuming that just because that's the largest size, or are you assuming that because you know the H and H study tells you that? Because the RFP specifically stated, you know, you need to consider it all. After that, I don't get more than that out of pathways. 
as far as you know coming up with more you know multiple designs um, whereas actually on creek basically said we're going to give you three different types of culverts designs which is a little bit different than so you know i give i give pathways credit for that part of that first sentence um, which is they got scored very high for that but then as you break down other aspects of the rfp basically the hours you know 100% more than even Stantec. And the fact that their experience with with these types of culverts seem to be minimal compared to everybody else, then it swings in favor of Otter Creek. Okay. Um, I think all of them worry about the committee process. Is that, is that something the engineering firm is going to be handling or is that something we're going to be involved in? Oh, say that again? The permitting process with because it's the agency of natural resources. Uh, so actually the permitting process will be essentially Scott Jensen and the stream management engineer process, so he has great sway. Yeah. So um, Otter Creek did mention that in their RFP that they would work hand in hand, but we already are anticipating doing that. He's going to be at the kickoff meeting. Um, the other one potentially is uh, Army Corps engineers. <laughs> and Otter Creek also mentioned that there is essentially a categorical exclusion from the Army Corps engineers for certain types of projects of which they felt this one fell in. Hmm. I checked with Scott Jensen and he confirmed that. And Otter Creek was the only one that mentioned that. So okay. I thought that that was another plus for Otter Creek. So those two permits, the only one I have to somewhat chuckle at is that Otter Creek also mentions the local floodplain permit, oh. of which we have handed off to the Planning Commission, but we have very little structure to. So right. if we need to actually do that, it'll take a little work to come up with the application and sure. stuff to give to okay. so. Um, and, and based on our conversation at the beginning of the night with the detour, um, under the federal right away and acquisition process, maybe we should ask Otter Creek to pay attention to the Bowers Road is used as the uh, people what can they do for signage or, or something like that. So the signage we've already drawn up. So the state of Vermont put together a traffic plan, um, which actually takes away from something Otter Creek needs to do. So the state of Vermont did that for us. I thought that was kind of a goodwill gesture, yeah. in particular because a third of the uh, the signage will be on Route 12. Mm -hmm. So the posts on the town portion are already in place. We're waiting. Um, the why this has not been closed already is that uh, the state of Vermont is doing a dig safe along Route 12. Uh, and we're waiting for them to put their signage in. So everything's kind of a go. We don't have an actual closing time because we're waiting on the state of Vermont. We expect that to be probably next week. But they did the actual traffic plan. Sure. We're just, you know, we unfortunately needed to, and this is part of the conversation, you know, $5,100 worth of posts and signs. Later, we have a traffic plan um, and signage in place that will be part of the FEMA reimbursement um, process. But um, so we talk about funding and having reserve accounts and perhaps, you know, a fund balance, a positive fund balance. Why you would want to have that, you know, we're talking about just one culvert from a FEMA event, you know, so already we're going to be $33,000 out of pocket before we get, you know, a reimbursement. So um, we will ultimately get reimbursed. It's just, you know. Well, how about, how about Tom's um, point about people coming out of Bowers Road? Is that going to be signed by the state? It'll be signed in that there's a detour. Speed limits and stuff is a whole different ball of wax that would need to be, we'd have to mark up another tree on that. Uh, 
um, do you need a motion for us to go with the Creek? Uh, if you'd like to acknowledge it, yeah, the motion would be good. Um, I think that, you know, yeah, I think I've got this uh, action on the agenda, but I think that this would just, you know, I think that um, a motion would be fine. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I'll make a motion to um, award the bid for the um, engineering studies for the missile culvert replacement to Otter Creek Engineering. Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Uh, everybody's good. We know you are. Yes. Bell nods. Everybody's good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mary. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> Especially that it's actually good to see. Is this an actual picture of that I don't. That one I don't think is. There is one. I don't know when. Wait, that one is? That one is. Oh, oh. Okay. When did, when did this uh, start? When did, we, when did the engineers... When did you add November, Dave? Yeah. Uh, this is a, so it'd be mid-November, right before Thanksgiving, maybe? Yeah, this is not a picture. Of me, cause that's, that's not a reason that freezes. Yeah. freezes. Yeah, I thought there were good pictures. I like yeah, they're, all, they're all nice packets. Yeah. <clears throat> well, pathways were up to there weren't very pictures, many yes. pictures, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can tell who the big players were. Um, yeah. Are they small? Go, backtracking to the moderator. <coughs> when do we have to make that appointment? Um, I, I don't think you need to have it in place. You know, I think you could put it in place a couple of weeks before. I think that okay, part of the concern was is that you have it in place enough so that they can go to the seminar. Well, yes. If we if we point, you know, I was thinking about Pat. I mean, she knows how to do it. So. Because she liked, she would want to know also. There isn't the, there isn't the legal deadline on that. Right? I don't think so. Yeah. So let's let it play out a little bit. Let's see if we find somebody. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it on the list. Until the next, at least until the next meeting. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, let's see. The van. The van for the Rex. You've got it all picked out anyways, right? Martin, you want, Martin, you want to come up for the band? Center, if they do, they venture out in bad weather. Would they need a four-wheel drive vehicle? No, put okay. winter tires on. It'd be all right with winter tires. Okay, because they're not. Most of these now, most of these come with electronic um, locking in the rear. So if one tire starts to spin, it locks up, so it won't spin. And there's winter, winter tires all the way around, right? Yeah. The school is canceled, right? If the weather's bad, so absolutely, so they won't be out. They wouldn't be no. going anywhere. No, they, went out, they went out today, but today wasn't that bad today. But no, we put winter tires on them. Yeah, they have one now that's 15 passenger. It's a little bit longer than this. And um, yeah, John says they just go slow and pay attention, and he says he, he has no issues. Yeah. Um, this one is a 2019. They bought it at the auction. John went down and looked at it on Friday. Um, they hadn't cleaned it yet. He says it looked like it just came out of the showroom. 
<laughs> so it's a nice clean, it's a nice clean van. And they were like twenty-seven thousand miles on it, right? Right. Yeah, twenty-seven thousand. Yeah, it's like a forty-two thousand dollar van. At least van. Um, well, it's only a year old, so I, I'm thinking no. somebody should use it as a shuttle van from business to an airport, or yeah. uh, Ford executives could use it to shuttle people in Michigan or something like that. Yeah. Dr. John looked at it and said it's just. Nice and clean, and, and he likes the space behind the rear seat because the 15 passenger doesn't have that space behind the rear seat because it has that extra seat. Mm -hmm. So they have space that they can, you know, so if they take it up to Maine on the camping trip, they got more space to, instead of cram, cramming it around the kids and down the aisles. That would be perfect for the Tiki Torch line. This has never been room for the snowshoes since. Yeah, yeah, it would be absolutely perfect for that. Yeah, absolutely. So, who owns this now? Uh, it's at Fort of Claremont. So, if you want to go down and see it, ask for Bob Buckman or Andy Booten. Um, like I said, John went down. They're supposed to get us a number for the trade-in on our van, and John's supposed to check with Moon Years to see how much. Because Moon Years bought our last van, or a wholesaler or somebody bought it from them, gave us fifteen hundred dollars. So we're trying to weigh whether it's worth trading in or whether we can get more money selling it outright through Moon Years wholesale. <laughs> It's a V6. It's the, the EcoBoost V6. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the gas mileage is, but I know that EcoBoost is a, is a good motor and it seems to get better gas mileage than the, the old fashioned V8s. Mm -hmm. So, what is it, a 12 passenger van? Yes. It's not going to get 35 miles to the No, 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 no. But it'll be in the 20s. Really? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that new V6. Um, Better than my car. <laughs> <laughs> um, the F 150, I know the F 150 V6s are getting 21, 22. And when they hit the interstate, some have been up to 24, 25 miles a week. So it will, I mean, once it's loaded, it won't, yeah. probably won't get more than 22, 23. But yeah, it's carrying miles. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Hmm. Um, do they consider anything else, any other models or? Uh, we didn't. I call. No, I just stuck with the Ford brand. Yeah. Um, the dealership's close by for warranty work. You know, if you go with the GMC, you go down to Springfield mm -hmm. or up to Wells River. Okay. Um, Does it have for a warranty on it, Mark? Uh, it'll have the balance of the warranty, so it'll be 7,000 miles. And then it'll have a five year unlimited mileage for rust and 880 on the emissions. So it's only got 7,000 miles left on the warranty? 336 for a base warranty. Three years or 36,000 miles for the base warranty. The powertrain will be 560. <coughs> um, the emissions, which is the catalytic converter, the O2 sensors, will be eight near 80,000 miles, and any rust is five year unlimited mileage. <laughs> What miles do they put on those, uh, on the van? The rack? Yeah. Not a lot. Yeah, I didn't think so. No, so, you, you know, you'll have, a, you'll have a good van for the next seven to ten years. Looks good to me. This is a plan purchase day. It is a plan purchase, about $6,000 more than we expected. I think 30 is probably pretty reasonable. Um, I think that it pulls down overall. I think going forward, you know, we put $5,000 more into this fund this year. Um, I think it's going to be, we need to keep an eye out on it. But this was, long and short of it is, this was planned. Um, the existing one that we have now is getting to the point where it's, it's getting rusted out pretty good. So if we did that grant for the old one, that would be nice. I think that's a pretty remarkable price. I, I'm surprised it's not more. What do you think it's a lot more? No, I'm, I'm surprised that it's not more. Oh, really? I think that sounds like a good 
Yeah, they did pretty good there, man. I've cared of them for many years, and they've one. done well. Uh, <laughs> I worked with them for many, many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, Buckman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Glad to hear Bob Buckman is still working on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, 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 he just keeps going. He <laughs> probably retired in the company. <laughs> I don't think he's wiping away. That's a good plan. <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess everybody's going to do something. No. No. That's a good move. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That was a good job. Yeah. Thank you. Some of the things we've already talked about, the Bike Fed program, uh, the state of Vermont um, is okay with um, Pete Fellows and Rita Cito um, for municipal project manager duties. Um, Two Rivers needs to respond to them with a formal proposal and cost estimates. Um, so Two Rivers, um, Peter Gregory said that I uh, spoke to him maybe before New Year's or Thursday afterwards, said that um, you have the staff do that. Um, the Mace Hill project, um, it appears that we're moving forward at this point. There was some um, concern, uh, more than a little bit of concern um, with FEMA and whether they were going to accept this as what's called a large scale project, which is over, 132,000, I may be off a couple thousand dollars on that, but $132,000, um, if it's above that, it's in a large scale category. If it's below that, it's in a small scale category. The importance of that is that if it's in the small scale category, it caps out and they won't pay anything above and beyond that amount. Um, they came back with cost, you know, a scope of this project that was like, 80 grand combined, complete, you know, everything. And that obviously is not nearly enough. So um, again, Chris Baum from District 4, State of Vermont, and Kim Karekia, I'm not gonna get that right, but um, Kim Karekia from Vermont Emergency Management. Um, Kim responded to FEMA saying, you know, we need to talk about this. Um, Chris put together some cost estimates of projects that he's done recently. Um, that one was at 160 grand without any, um, it was just on a back road somewhere, didn't need design services. So he submitted that to FEMA. FEMA seems to be, has taken that, is pass that on to the higher ups to be on the folks that kind of put that together as far as what they're <coughs> going to categorize this to. Um, our person that we deal with, uh, Rebecca, seems to think that that is okay, but um, it has been a little bit of a battle with FEMA um, for them to recognize this project um, where it needs to be as far as uh, a full FEMA reimbursement. Um, we seem to have submitted, I submitted the sign costs, um, the $5,100 today. I said, look, with the $5,100 and the um, engineering services, we're at 33 of the 80, so come on, you know, let's get real here. Um, she seems to have said, yep, I've passed this along. I'll let, you know, keep it in the loop. So this now that's been a back and forth that, um, has been a little bit of a battle, but um, both Vermont Emergency Management and um, our folks over in White River have been acting on our behalf um, quite nicely, I think, actually. Um, speaking of emergency management, I have spoken about this the past couple of meetings. Uh, our local emergency or our local hazard mitigation plan needs to be updated. Um, also, for grant purposes, I needed to follow our policy and put that out to bid, um, or actually put an RFP out. Um, I have four people I put that out to. Um, 
It was under $10,000. Um, I have heard back from one. I'm waiting to hear back from two rivers. The other two, I don't think I'll get a response from. Um, just know that we've got that kicking around out there in left field. Um, we'll need to pull that together. I gave them January 15th date to respond. Um, so once we have a response, um, we'll name somebody and they will become, you know, basically the consultant on this and I'll look to this person to essentially run the process. But we will need to partake in that to some degree. Um, actually, a large degree on my part, but um, one or two of you may need to participate as well. Uh, building permit, permit ordinance, we did not get the planning grant money, um, so we will need to kind of proceed as is. Um, so any legal review of that will come out of our pocket. Um, we'll see how much legal review is needed, but um, that will proceed maybe just on a slower track than what we've had if that was um, completely in um, Two Rivers' hands. Uh, so again, I'm just going to kind of recap. Um, I said this last year at this time, but uh, it is a very busy time, particularly between the Mace Hill project and the Three Corners Intersection project. Mace Hill in particular because FEMA is involved and there's some time constraints here. Um, everybody that responded to this said it was on a tight schedule. It remains on a tight schedule. We can only work in the waterway between like July 15th and October 15th. Um, so there's a chance that things could not work out. I mean, it's, again, it's going to have to go pretty darn smoothly to go out to bid at the end of April, um, get those back and have them available to do the work. Um, so just know that um, it's also a culvert that needs the work and we can't avoid that either. So um, kind of is what it is and uh, we'll proceed um, as we can and, and continue with the work. Um, rec center steps um, still needs to be put into place. Um, still need to um, get away for the local hazard mitigation stuff to come back. The grounds um, work needs to be put out to bid. Um, and the last thing I'm going to mention I'm a little concerned about, um, the IT services also needs to be addressed. Um, that is up in February. It's a three-year contract. Um, I don't think, based upon everything that we have on our plate, we're going to be able to put out an actual, you know, and I'm not exactly sure who is out there to put out kind of a request for services on this. Um, I'm not entirely sure we want to switch services with these folks. Um, I feel fairly comfortable with them. There's certain things that I'm not particularly happy with with them. Um, it's more more of a personal issue with myself and um, you know a couple of their, their key people and, and getting them to you know that the server change over um, and making you know I they've kind of tied that into the contract renewal um, I kind of look at that as kind of a sales ploy yeah. having been in sales I'm not overly happy with it so that's just um, that's just a thing between myself and, and them I think the actual services are fine and we, we get what we we pay for um, and then some but just know that this is coming up in February um, can you just do a one year extension I don't think they're going to just allow a one-year extension. I think they're going to want to tie in the three years, uh, is my gut. This last one was a three-year one. Um, I think they're going to say, you know, I, I think they can, I don't think they're going to go for that. I think they'll say, okay, you're going to sign a one-year extension and then bolt to somebody else. Um, it's just possible. But, uh, um, at the moment, I'm, I'd like to see them maybe pull us through the server thing and, and move on. Um, we've got a lot on our plates to kind of contend with uh, outside of the IT services, which is a fairly important component of what we do. Um, I'm, fairly, I, I'm very happy with the services we get other than this kind of hardball tactic that you know, it's being played between back and forth is, is a little bit undesirable, but I think that's kind of a side issue. Um, just know that that's 
out there. Um, if time permits, um, we'll kick the tires, but um, that just may be, you know, the, the culvert I think takes center stage here and trying to get that moving along. Um, I can live with the IT and um, what we're getting from them and what we're paying. Um, it just may be something that we, if needed to, we address at a later point. And another volatility you talked about earlier is with the Nimerick, not so much on the accountants, about the whole kit and caboodle if, they, if the state changes. Yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I've sat through a lot of public input hearings on this, and they're talking, they're saying everything I want to hear, um, yet they're not on schedule, so. Yeah. It sounds like they're in a 3GL world where the world is moved to relational databases and whole nine yards. And, uh, but from a IT services perspective, we don't care what, where, what that solution is, because that machine will run it anywhere. Yeah. So they're all web-based services now, so that's going to not put any impact on your desktop machines. <coughs> we are very concerned that our ability to function uniformly, the, the whole system is, is entirely synthesized. So the assessed value and the grand list ties into the tax billing. The tax billing ties into the accounting software and um, you know our revenue stream yeah. and all of that. So it's all from soup to nuts, beginning to end. So we are, from an IT perspective, very concerned that whatever the state of Vermont pulls out, um, Doug's computer may be able to talk to the states, but we want to make sure that whatever information we accumulate and get back and forth from the state of Vermont mm -hmm. is dispersed amongst our own system as it should. I'm not, they're saying everything I want to hear, and they seem to be aware of everybody's concerns, and if they pick a non nimric product, that that non nimric product will speak with a memory product that we've got. Um, yeah. um, we'll see. Not only that, but if it doesn't talk to the memory, we'll have to make a program to do it and charge everybody a fee. Right. Well, except for the state RFP, the state RFP put that liability on whoever gets the state oh. contract. Oh, no. So whoever gets the state contract uh, supposedly is supposed to be able to speak with Henry. Oh, okay. Obviously, there's a user fee which the state of my house pay for, but um, you know who knows. It's, that's not easy. No. They say it's gonna work. I, I make it up, so. <laughs> I read an article about them changing the state college payroll system, and I guess it's been a nightmare. It's... They changed the judicial, judicial side of the computer system, too. We didn't get paid since May. We finally got it a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we all know the state has been horribly behind on the software stuff. They're still running cobalt-based yeah. systems. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. And there's four systems at EMB. I know you guys have been here a while, but just to give you some, so... The HS 122, which is your part of your tax form that you declare your residency, you know, so you get, it allows you to get your rebate on your tax form. So, and this will probably come up at a later t at the select board meeting, but so if you miss that, so essentially, if it doesn't go out on the initial tax bill, so it's to say you file late. Mm -hmm. So the back and forth between the state and the town on that information alone yeah. is, is chaotic. We reprint bills. Every Monday. Every, every week we get a new updated list of who's now gotten a credit, you know, that didn't have one, you know, whatever. So now take into your 
the conservation easement, your, your um, what's the state program? Current use chaos that goes back and forth between the state of Vermont and the town, and that information that goes back and forth on this system. And granted, we need to, the system is, is old and archaic now, and the state wants to also have greater access to our information to make their life easier. So, I don't know where this is gonna, they say it's gonna work. It's gonna be all the They say it's gonna work. It's, well, uh, people have voiced their concerns. Well, Dave, before we adjourn, you said something about having a draft of the audit. Yes. Did that come in? Uh, we're gonna call him today, actually. We're gonna call and talk to Tyler. He's trying to fix that. Okay. Page. So um, we have a draft of the audit, of which there was some things that um, we felt as though weren't presented correctly, um, and they are fixing that. So I think that most of the detailed information that they've got is, is for the most part, our balance sheet and theirs matches. Um, there's some of the finer details that um, they need to address and some a little bit more work um, and they should have a finished draft relatively soon. So and this, this thing about $29,000, that was fantastic. So two things, I've been, I'm holding out on this information just because <laughs> I want to make sure. I want to make sure, I want to see the final audit first, but um, I believe that, and again, this ebbs and flows with delinquent taxes, but I, I believe our, our deficit um, has been extinguished um, and that we've actually swung to a surplus, at this point, a small surplus. Um, so that is, that was a pretty good swing. So delinquent taxes played a pretty big part in that. So that being said, we are down to 29,000. All good, the key is, is that in actual February and March, that we keep that, you know, what happens is, we have $500,000 delinquent, so, you know, we had $500,000 delinquent in February, so just now in January, eight months later, we're down to 29, so it crimps the cash flow quite a bit. So the key is to, hopefully people are starting to get it that you need to pay on time. Mm -hmm. You know, we understand you're probably, you know, situations and stuff like that, we try and work with that, but, we need people to pay on you time. anticipate we'll be back up to 500000 after tax time or after the second bill? No. I would probably say, I'm going to say maybe a 450 number. Really? I, the only reason I say that is because two years in a row it's been up over 500000 Is there a number that didn't make the first payment? I actually go first uh, after. We're at like 92% yeah. paid in the first payment. So we're, we're in pretty good shape. So we felt as though after, during the last delinquent tax sale, we leading up to that, we felt as though people were getting the message and that we were having more people come in and pay their bills. Um, so we felt as though that was positive. And David had an uptick of people paying monthly contracts. We're up to like, I think 18 or 20 people were, when the first time we had, I think you had three people. We had a couple of people that I think if we weren't doing what we were doing, would probably have not have. He's a delinquent pay, taxpayers are making monthly payments. So We've had a few people that were real foot draggers that have come through. And yeah. I've actually made substantial damage. Okay. Mm -hmm. A couple of familiar faces still in here. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. Tough one for people. May the potholes be shallow and <laughs> <laughs> until next time. <laughs> When it goes from 17 on Monday to 50 something on Saturday, that's just a night. It's just a recipe for potholes, man. Yeah, it is. Trigger road.
take a road down has ruts and that's all from the freezing and thawing and it's not really the mud, it's just the, the weather. The weather. Yeah. So our next meeting would be um, the 20th on Martin Luther King Day. So will we meet on Tuesday instead? We'll be here every day for them. <laughs> on Tuesday. Yeah. Just have to. Well, we do need to meet on Tuesday. Yes. Should we put the focus of decision? Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, it's, so I will be here on Monday. I got it. Yeah. Don't know how, we did meet one year. Tuesday. We don't meet on holidays. Generally. We should. Yeah. So you also may have to make up one of your 26 meetings. You may have to have an extra one Monday the 27th. I feel... Why? I, for the warning. For the warning. The article or the petitions are due on the 16th. Our next meeting is on the 20th. So whether I can put this all together and, and have it presented to you is questionable. Um, I thought originally our meeting was on the 18th, the fact that it's actually on the 21st gives me a little bit more time. Um, but it's, it's very tight. We're very constrained here, so we may need to meet for the art for the warning. Actually, for the actual warning, I think we will. I think the articles, the independent articles, or the appropriations and some of the special stuff kicking around, I can have. But the other stuff, I don't know if I'll have. So we definitely will. It will be the 21st and the 28th. No. Potentially the 27th. I would just keep the 27th an X on your calendar. Okay. Well, I'll be in Boston on the 27th. Anybody have any things to bring up? Mary be glad to do that. No, no that's <laughs> not sexist. Oh my god. Here's somebody who could do the minutes right here. You're always the next in line, man. You're literally you can... know the other way. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm so hungry. Can we go home please, go in Yeah, if you have any issues. It's only five after five. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you for solving that mystery of the... I hope that's what it is. I yeah, know that happens to me. I'm yeah. going to go home and change my diaries. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y